these protesters are calling for access to affordable housing. This is one of many similar demonstrations I've seen over recent months. But looking across London's skyline, there's no shortage of housing developments. I can see clusters of cranes and scaffolding towers wherever I look. But the problem is, only a fraction of these homes will be genuinely affordable. Although developers are required by law to include a certain percentage of affordable homes in each of their developments, typically 30 to 40 percent, there are ways around this. By arguing that a project would not be economically viable if this means affordable homes are included, developers can negotiate down their requirements with the local council, or in some cases, simply pay them off. To understand more, I went for a walk through the heart of Westminster with Mark Francis, campaigns director for the anti-poverty charity Zacchaeus 2000. I wanted to take a closer look at Westminster's most prominent new development, a former site of the New Scotland Yard. So we're just coming up to New Scotland Yard site. Um, it's 268 flats. Um, Ten of those are um, affordable in broad terms, and the developer is also um, paying a £10 million contribution, they call it a payment in lieu, supposedly for more social affordable housing in future, somewhere, but um, not here. On this huge site, a stone's throw from the Palace of Westminster, a private developer is building 268 homes. According to the council's own rules, 35% of these should be affordable homes. And yet, on this site, only 3% are. But that wasn't the end of the story. The applicant then came in after they got their permission in 2016, I think it is, looking for an amendment, 27 additional units. So obviously all going on the top, a few more penthouses, and uh, none of those were going to be affordable. The new Scotland Yard site is typical of many developments in central London and goes a long way to explain why there is such a shortage of affordable homes in the capital. A shortage that's felt by those at the sharp end, like Jahida, she spent 10 years on a waiting list. When a house eventually became available in Catford, it was a long way from where her children went to school and where her community network was in Brixton. I was on a register, we were on a register for 10 years and we were bidding and there were like nothing to do, complaint after complaint. I've met, I've, I've seen the MP, the councillor. We had the problem as well because we were on top of accommodation in Tulse Hill and they wanted to move us as soon as possible. So it was like they were like proposing us like uh, accommodation very far and uh, we had no choice but to accept Catford. And I'm like, I have children, you know, I can't just... I refused, I said I refused to move in Catford and it was just like, a, if you refuse, you will be, make yourself uh, uh, intentionally uh, homeless. And I'm like, no, because my children go to school in London, so, you know, I'm... Although Jahida was typical of many of the people I spoke to, some endure far worse conditions. In some cases, people in temporary accommodation who are waiting for housing can find themselves sharing single rooms with five or six others for years. Nick is a caseworker with a charity that represents people in temporary accommodation. It's typically very, very poor quality private landlord accommodation, typically one room. Um, what's ambitiously called a studio, but it's really a series of beds, single beds, sofa beds in a single room um, with a sort of bathroom, maybe a separate kitchen. But with so many residential developments going up across London and the law requiring a significant proportion of them to be affordable, why isn't there a pipeline of houses being built in central London? Tony Devonish is a councillor in Westminster and is also a member of the Greater London Assembly's planning committee. This means he has a say on whether planning applications in the capital get approved. He thinks that in many cases, councils can get more bang for their buck by building on the outskirts of London. If you have a very expensive piece of land in central London, you would get more social housing by building, dare I say it, on the edge of London, which has been the direction of travel for recent years. He also defends the council's policy of negotiating with developers when it comes to the number of affordable homes they must build in return for granting planning permission. Remember, we have to encourage, dare I say it, the private sector to come to our boroughs to want to work with us. And they, I, I'm, I mean, I'm a conservative. They have to make a profit as well. And, you know, we all know that houses go down as well as up. They've gone up 
pretty much uh, in one single line for the last 20 odd years, but it's no secret that for the last 11 months in the papers today, house prices in London are going down. And for the last three years, much of central London has been, if not going down, certainly not going up. But opponents of Councillor Devonish argue that his council holds the keys to some of the most prime real estate in the world. Shouldn't they simply withhold planning permission until a developer agrees to build their full quota of affordable homes? To help me understand why, I've come down to one of London's oldest inns of court, Middle Temple, to meet a barrister who can help. I'm Nick Ostrowski, I'm a barrister, I practice at a chambers called Six Pump Court. Um, I practice in a few different areas, but um, about half of what I do is planning law. I asked him why local councils don't stand their ground. It would be possible to put a blanket requirement that no planning permission will be granted unless there is X percent affordable housing. What that will mean is that sites which are perfectly located for housing and we are in the middle of a housing crisis will never be built. And I think sometimes there can be a sense that, oh, well, of course a site will be built on because it's, it's, you know, it's perfect, it's inevitable. Well, that's simply not right. I mean, look at Battersea Power Station. That site has been known for literally decades to be perfect for residential development, suitable for thousands upon thousands of homes. If the councils there had insisted on, let's say, 50% affordable housing or 40% affordable housing, which is the normal target in, in London and the South East, that would never have been built on. Whatever the explanation is, most of those I spoke to agreed that London boroughs, and Westminster specifically, do not build anywhere near enough affordable houses. Mark Francis again. Westminster's own housing strategy adopts a, a target of only 250 new affordable homes a year, of which something around a half are intermediate homes for people that are in work on incomes of up to £80,000 a year. So essentially you're talking about a target of 100 new homes a year. And you've got 6,000 people on the households on the waiting list and a target of building 100 new homes a year. Those things are completely out of sync. Adam Hugg agrees. He is an opposition Labour councillor in Westminster and is critical of the local authority's record on affordable housing. Westminster's housing targets are not particularly challenging. They're 25% in, in the central activity zone, 35% outside, so 30% overall, um, which isn't high by council standards, but, but routinely they would get nowhere near that. Uh, I think the most recent GLA statistics have their average uh, building at about 12%, which is... Which, uh, is fairly shocking. But our barrister, Nick Ostrovsky, maintains that commercial realities in a city like London cannot be ignored, and this is why viability assessments exist. Yes, there are targets, but all those targets are subject to viability um, on the basis that if they weren't subject to viability, developers would simply say, well, I'm not going to build there, I'll put my money into some other investment. Britain is one of the few countries where responsibility for building affordable housing is pushed onto private developers. And when we see how unsuccessful this policy is at delivering the number of homes we need, it's hardly surprising that other countries have avoided this model. Nick Ostrovsky has a radical suggestion to help solve this problem. I mean, if, if you want a positive solution to the problem, I think it's this. Give local authorities the power to borrow money which at the moment they can't do, or they are limited in their ability to do, give them the ability to borrow money, build sites themselves and build council houses. Because that would mean that then those sites um, could be bought up by councils and built on, and that might provide an alternative source of housing, other than at the moment our effectively almost total reliance on private developers who will just follow the money. And if we make life too hard for them, they'll go elsewhere. He is not alone in seeing the state as the best provider of social housing. But for the almost 250,000 people on housing waiting lists in London alone, this won't solve their current problems. They need the housing developments currently under construction across London to also include homes they can afford to live in. The current housing policy was meant to deliver this, but somewhere along the way, it's failed them. Until we find a solution to this crisis of affordable homes, we can expect more protests from those who've run out of patience and have nowhere left to turn. What do we want? Council housing!